Welcome back to Magic TV. My name is Craig. It is nine o'clock, which means it's time for a Talk Magic. And I am here with a good friend, an amazing magician, probably the best looking man in magic as well, which is, uh, which is, which is such a title to give him. But he is unbelievable. And also one of the hardest working magicians I've ever met, the one and only Tom Wright. How are you doing, Tom? I'm all right, mate. I don't know about the best looking magician in magic. No, oh it's, either, it's either you or it's either you or Jessica Styles. I, I can't decide between you. You both, you both. Yeah, are. well, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know. I think David Stone has got to be. Yeah, but he's getting he's on a pretty bit good now, looking right? guy. Getting on a bit now. Ah, ah bit. but yeah, I don't know. He's up there. He's up there. He's up there. He's up there. Yeah, but you know what? I know you've been busy through lockdown. I know you have. Uh, you've been doing Zoom shows. You were just telling me off camera you've been working last week with uh, with DHL, which is amazing. Uh, and obviously now we're seeing things at time of filming opening back up, which is good. So yes. thank you so much for finding time to jump on the channel. Yes, all right, mate. It's absolutely my pleasure. Looking forward to where this conversation takes us. Well, you know what? I mean, a lot of people are going to know you in the magic community with the amazing stuff that you've released. And obviously, you know, we did an interview a couple of weeks ago where we talked about gravity, which is your newest thing, yeah. which is just taking the magic world by storm. But I want to start off at the very beginning for people that don't really know Tom <coughs> Wright outside of your creations. I want to start. A lot of people might not know outside of the stuff that you've created. You are just a very, very busy in demand um, magician, you know, I mean, you are always performing, you're always busy, you're always performing at a very high level, and I have so much respect for you, and I want people to know about that side of you. So let's start at the very beginning, because okay. when did you, your origin story into magic is a little bit different than most. You weren't, you, you didn't get a magic set when you were three years old, or an uncle pulling a coin from behind your ear, or, or did you? Because I seem to remember at some point you telling me you're a builder or something. So uh, maybe I've got that story mixed up. Why don't you help me out? You kind, you've kind of, you kind of got it right. Okay, so um, the the origin story, the origin story, um, the origin story of Tom Wright. Okay, so um, well, first of all, it was my granddad. I know a lot. Of this, so it starts off kind of the same. My granddad uh, used to teach me magic when I was a kid. He wasn't a magician. He just knew a lot of magic tricks. I think a lot of granddads do. Uh, he was in World War II, and he used to um, perform magic tricks to his uh, fellow troops uh, to sort of keep them, keep the spirits up. He also used to play the spoons. I don't know, I, I can't do that, but we put two spoons together and it's like a drum. Um, he used to do that. So he was kind of a, you know, a bit of a, bit of a joker. Um, and he used to teach me sort of some stuff as well. Um, so that's where it kind of started, and I was really fascinated, not just with magic, but it wasn't magic in particular. I was just fascinated with entertainment. I was fascinated with watching comedies on TV, and it was mainly kind of like the Saturday night television, like Cannon and Ball, Wayne Dobson, Paul Daniels. You had reruns of Tommy Cooper. And then you had all the comedies like Faulty Towers and Porridge and Only Fools and Horses. And, and that is what I just, the, that type of entertainment I really, really liked. Um, and stuff like that. So that's where my buzz for performing came from. Um, and then, so I started to learn, and I started to learn magic and get along with that. And, there was this little battle between my two granddads. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll explain. So my granddad, Alf, which is my mum's side, he's the one who, was, who used to teach me all the magic. My granddad, Bill, which was on my dad's side, he was very cynical. And every time I used to travel to his house, show him the magic trick, and he used to work it out. He used to shoot me down and tell me exactly how I did it. He was like, you know, well, you've obviously got two cards there and you've done this, you've done that. Obviously, that's stupid. That's how it's done. I mean, you know, everyone else, you know, was saying, oh, wow, that's so good, Tom. I was eight. I was eight. I was eight years old. And he'd tell me of how good I was. And, but my granddad, Bill, he was like straight and narrow. He said no. And I used to go back and forth between my granddads. And then it was my granddad was like, you know, try this one, try this one. So I'd go back to my granddad, Bill, and try to... Um, 
try to outdo him. So in fact, the one trick that fooled him the most was a trick by Tenyo. And it was the crystal clear that fooled him. With the sword and the box, he couldn't figure it out. He had no idea. He said, do it again, do it again, do it again. And in the end, um, he, he took it apart. Um, in <laughs> Took it apart because he couldn't. He couldn't figure it out. Um, he, uh, it, he felt really bad. He, he tried to glue it back together and it didn't work. Uh, but uh, that was my brother. Uh, but um, well, no. What happened was that after two weeks, I went to him. I showed him how it worked. He was gobsmacked, and he was trying to work out how it actually works. Why does that come up? And then he broke the spring. Then I'm supposed to say that. Um, and. Um, and he tried to glue it back, but yeah, so that's where it all kicked off. And then um, when I was uh, 12 years old, I joined a, a local magic club called the Ace Magicians Club um, because it wasn't allowed to be called the Grimsby Magic Circle for obvious reasons. Um, so it was called the Ace Magicians Club and I joined that. And then I worked in a magic shop when I was about 16. Um, and I worked in, in Cleethorpes and I used to work there from the age from about 15 to 18, I worked there like on the weekends, learning all the magic in the shop. And obviously that's where the gift of the gab came from, I think, because obviously people were coming in, I was trying to sell them the tricks. Um, and then it got to the point, I also went to college and I, went, I wanted to be an actor because I didn't want to be a magician. Uh, magic was just a hobby. Um, I just wanted to be an actor. Magic, I never thought that you could actually uh, go out and earn money as a magician, I thought that was ludicrous. I thought, how do you earn money as a magician? I mean, obviously that's just stupid. I mean, that doesn't exist. So I, uh, but I wanted to be an actor, you know, one of the hardest professions to get in. So I wanted to be that. Um, so I went to college, got the Actor of the Year award and stuff like that. Um, but somewhere down the line, it just didn't work out. I did a few acting jobs. Uh, I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, didn't have anyone to teach me of, how to get into the acting world. I was very young. And then that's when my dad turned around and said, right, you know, um, you've tried um, as an actor, but you know, you, you, um, you might as well come with me and um, start, uh, I mean, well, what he, actually, what he actually said was, you can't be funny and about on stage all your life. Uh, you need a real job. That's, that's what, that was his exact words. Um, and then that's it. what I did. I went back to college, which is so degrading, going back just on three years. And then I did a year out and tried to be an actor and then went back into the real world doing three years of how to learn to lay bricks. So that was, that was really, that was a killer because my dreams were shattered. You know, I, all my life since I was a kid, my granddad teach me magic working in a magic shop, always entertaining, thinking I was going to be an actor. And I wasn't quite sure, but I knew I wanted to be an entertainer of some kind. And then going back and doing bricklaying was like a proper shock to the system. It was like, okay, that's all, all my dreams that I've been dreaming of since I was a kid. Uh, that's all. That's, that's over now. It's, it's finished. It's, uh, I am now just, I'm going to be a bricklayer. That's, that's my life. And I was about, 18 and it was like oof. yes difficult but I did enjoy laying bricks and I did enjoy working with my dad um I did enjoy doing that um but I knew it wasn't what I wanted to do it wasn't me that's not what I wanted to do but I did enjoy working with my dad a lot um yeah so I mean I I really did enjoy working with my dad a lot and it was you know it was great we had a great laugh um and uh but yeah it wasn't it just wasn't what i wanted to it just wasn't what it just wasn't me but i don't worry i was good at it and it's great that i've got it i've always got that trade um you know i can always go back to it if i if i if i need to in the, in the uh in the future but um yeah it was it was strange because it was a bit of a role reversal because then my dad turned around to me and he said um he said uh whilst we were sort of working together and uh, he said oh why don't you um why don't you give magic a go which is weird because it was you know it was that kind of a raw virtual thing and, and what my response to my dad was I said but you know what 
And he went, why don't you know, try out and um, be a, sort of be a magician. I said, what do you mean be a magician? He said, and I said to him, I went, dad, that's just like a really stupid idea. I said, what are you on about? I said, you can't go out and be a magician. How can you be a magician? I said, what do you mean? So it's why you go out and, you know, try to get paid. Isn't it? I said, what do you mean? I said, you, you can't go and work as a, I said, dad, I don't, and then I sort of mulled it over and thought about it. I thought, well, maybe. I said, I said maybe there's something in it. I said, I don't know, where would I start? So, I mean, yes, I've been doing magic all my life, but I didn't know that you could go out, you know, and do it as a job. Um, you know, so I thought about it, and I spoke to my friend who was another magician friend of mine who was called Gary Bryson, who was very, again, he was very influential. Not many people know who Gary is, and they should do. Um, but Gary Bryson was very influential uh, in his fantastic magician. He used to teach me a lot of magic. And he, uh, he actually owned the, the magic shop. Um, and he said to me, what you need to do is really simple. Get yourself some business cards, get yourself a flyer, get yourself a, a banner and go to a wedding fair. That was, a, that was his exact things. And I thought, OK, so I've got business cards, got flyers and I had them all designed and it cost quite a lot of money. In fact, my mum paid for it at the time good old mum, right? Um, and um, we went to a proper designer. And I think back then, roller banners were really expensive. I think a roller banner was £150. I think that was like the minimum you could get it at, whereas now they're only, you know, 50 quid or something. But back then, they were fairly new. Um, and um, so, I mean, I'm 36 now, so you're going back quite a long time. And so I was 21, and... Uh, I thought what I'll do is I thought maybe I can put them in some wedding shops to begin with. And this is where the first breakthrough came through. So I took my business cards, took my some flyers. I thought what I'll do is I'll drive around wedding shops and see if I can put my flyer in the window and see what happens. So I drove to a wedding shop and I must have sat in my car for about an hour, 45 minutes to an hour contemplating, do I go inside of this shop and make a fool of myself? Am I going to make a fool of myself going in there as a kid, young 21 year old kid and saying, can I put this poster in your window? Uh, because I'm a wedding magician expert. Never done a gig. I, 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 I had done a few gigs when I was 15, 16, but you're talking, it was very minimal. It was nothing. But this was actually starting out as a venture, as a, as a job. So I, um, I went in. And I said, oh, can I put this flyer in your window? And the lady who owned the shop, she said, well, you can do, but we need to see what you do. Because obviously, it's our clients. If they're going to come in and book you, we need to know that if you're good or not. And um, so I said, OK, and I showed them some magic. And then um, they started bringing in, oh, you know, Sandra, come look at this, you know. And everyone started coming around. And there was a big crowd of people. And I started, I was like, my heart was like, <laughs> so I started showing him some magic. And um, she, she, I said, can I put my leaflet in your window? She said, yeah, sure you can. He said, oh, and then she said, before you leave, uh, what are you doing this Saturday? And I said, um, I'm not doing anything. And she said, it's our daughter's 18. How much do you charge? And I was like, no way. And I was like, and I went, what, what, 50 quid. And she went, booked. And I was like, yes. I thought, like, obviously, I was. First gig. So I walked out of there with 50 quid in my back pocket for that 18. And I couldn't believe it. It was like a light bulb, mo a light bulb moment. As soon as I walked out, I was buzzing. I just thought, hang on a minute, hang on a minute. I thought, it can't be that easy. I thought, it can't be that easy. I said, that was too easy. I said, I've only been to one shop. I, there's, there's loads of them. I've only been to one. If I can do that and get 50 quid. I can do that again. And of course, I went out, did the wedding fair, got loads of gigs. And of course, my price, I don't charge 50 quid now. Just so. <laughs> I was 20, I was 20, I was 21. 50 quid was a lot. Um, and um, you still work just very quickly. Were you still doing the bricklaying as well at the same time? Yes, I was. So I was bricklaying for five years. Um, whilst I was doing magic and I did that and it was hard because obviously for five days of the week I was working outside in all sorts of weather um so sometimes I would turn up to a gig and I would be just absolutely orange because I'd been out working all week and I'm all sunburned now going to a wedding 
or sometimes my calluses on here were really uh, bad because I've been working outside in like the cold and my fingertips started to get really rough. So like things like doing a double lift were quite difficult to do because I couldn't really feel it on my actual skin, getting the, the two cards together, I, I was struggling. So it wasn't a bit of a struggle doing certain magic moves because of that. Uh, but then after about five years, I built my clientele up and up and up and I couldn't cope anymore because I was knackered. You imagine doing five days a week and then doing a gig Friday night, Saturday night, having one day off, if you have one day off, and then going back to bricklaying on Monday. It was, just killed me. Uh, and in the end, I thought, right, I think it's time to leave the bricklaying. I reckon I can... It was that crossover moment where I went, right, I can leave. So I left bricklaying, pursued magic, and as they say, the rest is history. So that's the origin story. I think I've mentioned everything. Sorry if I uh, waffled oh, that, on. That, you didn't waffle at all. That was really interesting. So, so kind of, you, you, you're now in a position where you've left the Blick Rain, you're a full-time magician. At this point, you've only really been doing close-up magic. And I know, obviously, yeah. a big thing that you do now is stage work. And we'll get to that transition in a bit. But you, for a long time in your career, you embraced close-up magic. And in a bit, we're going to talk about uh, sort of the creativity side of things. But one thing that you popularized on one of your DVDs was the concept of stand-up magic, which had never oh, been yes. seen before, which was the whole idea of going into a close-up gig and getting everyone to stand up. Is that I I know. Mean, so unique? And I, 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 not enough people have seen that DVD. because it's, it's such a brilliant idea. Is that something that you developed early on in your career? Was this something that, because, or was it something that happened later on? It happened later on, definitely, for sure. It happened where, I think, mid. I think it happened mid. Um, how old was I? I think I was maybe, I can't remember, 20, maybe 26. Between 26 and 28, I can't pinpoint the exact age I was. Um, and it was an accident. Well, it wasn't an accident. It, it was, well, it was a fluke. So what happened was at this time, this, it was, okay. So it was after Oblivion. Uh, Oblivion is my, my coin spin that I do. It was after that. And um, I think it was a short time after that. So whatever time period that was, that's how old I was. I can't remember what it was. So I was going, I was doing a, uh, a wedding, actually not so far from here, actually. And I was going from table to table. And how it worked out was um, I went to a table and I was, ah, that was right. I was practicing. I'd only just come up with, I'd only just invented Oblivion. So it was just before Oblivion came out. I just invented Oblivion and I was sort of testing it and I was practicing it and I thought, right, it's ready to go out and perform. So I went up to the table and I thought, ah, I can't really do Oblivion because when it drops, See, this is this is the uh, this is the table. As soon as the coin drops, they're not going to see it because they're all sat down. So j it's just going to look like I've dropped the coin or something. So I thought, but I really I can remember being at this table and this table were like they were a dream audience. And you know when you get and to me, you should only really practice your new magic on your dream audiences. There's no point wasting it on an audience where they're going to give you, you know, they're going to break your balls. Do practice your new magic on the dream audience. Wait until you get that audience where you know they're there and you know you're good. So this audience was fantastic. They were loving it. And I thought, I really want to do this oblivion trick, but I know that they're not going to be able to see. And then I don't know where it came from. It just, it just the light bulb came on. I thought, hang on a minute, I could get them to stand up. I thought, well, if I get them to stand up, I mean, surely that's going to be fine it's only for one trick and this all ran through my head within like three seconds so i thought oh guys do you mind if you just sort of like maybe just stand up because i really want to show you this one last trick and as i'm they're all getting up as i'm still talking i thought that and i was looking around going that was really quick they're all stood up okay okay so i did oblivion they freaked out and then i thought the reaction was so larger than life and I just thought, and what I did is I stepped back a little bit from the table so they could see the coin drop and I asked them to come around a little bit. Though. But I thought, well, while, while I've got them stood up, I thought maybe I could do some other stuff 
that I would never do at a table because it only really works in a walk around situation, right? Mm -hmm. Because the problem with tables is not every tables, but a lot of venues, you get loads of stuff in the middle. You get a big vase, you've got all those little gem things in, there's flowers. And when you're, when you go to the table, if people are sat down, they're sort of like doing this, trying to look around whatever is in the way and they're sort of doing that. And if, if you get them to stand up, then, well, that's all that gone because now they can all see you. But I'll, I'll go through all the benefits of why you should do it. Obviously, it's not going to work in every environment. Um, you go to some gigs, you might do it every table. You might go to another gig, you might just do it a couple of times. You might go to another gig and you go, it's just not going to work at this one. I'm just going to leave it out. Or you might just do it to one table. You need to do it when it feels right. Um, so that's how it came about. And then I thought, okay. That worked really well. I thought, I wonder if I if I go and I started thinking, hang on a minute. As I'm thinking, and I started doing stand-up Monty. Now I wouldn't do stand-up Monty at a table. I just don't think it would work. Because again, you've got lots of things in the middle. And if you're putting cows on the table on the opposite side of that, then they're gonna be doing this, aren't they? And then the, if you think about it, the kind of the people at the back. I kind of stood up anyway because they're halfway stood up doing this. So you, they're, they're doing this and they're doing that. They might as well just stand up because they're practically standing up to see what you're doing. Uh, so when, whilst all this group was stood up, I did stand up magic and I did like coinvex, which I would never do coinvex at a table. I just don't think it works because I don't know about other magicians, but when I go to a table, I want the whole attention of that table. I do not at all, do not want to be performing to half or just a couple of people. When I go to a table, I am performing to that table and every single person sat at that table is watching me. I know that sounds arrogant, but that, that's, that's the whole point of the magician. When the magician goes to the table, the table watches. You don't want to be performing to half. You want to be performing to everyone. That's the whole point. Um, so. Um, I forgot my train of thought. Um, so yeah, so I started doing stand-up munching, coinvex and stuff like that. And then I realized, hang on a minute, there's so much stuff that I can do. And at, at that time, I didn't realize the benefits of what's good about stand-up magic. I had no idea because I'd only just landed upon it. So what I did is I went to the next table and I thought, I wonder if I can get them to stand up at the beginning, just as a test. So I went to the table, I said, hi guys, my name's Tom, magician. Um, you know, you've got a lot of things in the middle here. Do you mind maybe standing up for about two to five minutes? I think it will be just more beneficial for you. You'll be able to see more. And like they stood up like, like just straight away. It's like bang, shut up. Because you're saying to them, would you like to see some magic? My conditions for you to see magic is for you to stand up. It's like, that's like, it's, so it's like a contract almost. It's like, do you want to see magic? Just sign here and then you, that's it. The contract is you stand up, I perform. Um, and it, it, it worked. And then I couldn't believe of how good it was. And I started doing it and doing it more and more. And I didn't know why I liked it. I, well, I knew a few things, but I thought I've got something here. I don't know what it is, but I'm going to keep doing it until I figure out why it's so good. And then I just did it more and more and more and then realized, oh, oh my God, oh, that's good. And then I realized more and more stuff. And then that's how Stand Up Magic was born. Do you want yeah. me to, so, go on, sorry. No, carry on, what did you say? Uh, I was gonna say, did you want me to tell you some benefits of why, of why yeah, I do it? Please do, Tom, that'd be great, yes, please. Okay, so, um, all right, this, there's a lot. Uh, I'll, in no particular order, all right. The great, this is just one thing I've just thought of. So one great thing is you've got no other tables watching, right? Just think about that. No other table is watching because they can't see, right? So you're going up to a table. You've got everyone stood up. You've got this 360, 360 degrees thing going on. As you know, as a, as a magician, as a table performer, when you go and perform to a table, a lot of the time, some other tables sneakily start watching, right? And um, so you're performing, and then the problem with that is if you're doing something like, just for an example, bottle through table. Now that table over there 
And that table over there now know that when you that you're going to do, you're going to push a bottle through the table. They now know the ending. Now again, shot the cup when you produce the cup. They know there's a tennis ball. So the problem with that is that's why us magicians have two sets or three sets or whatever. So you do one set of that table and then you do a completely different set of that table. And the reason for that is, is because that table could have been watching this table and what you've been doing. That's the whole point of two different sets. So you're chopping and changing. But if you're stand-up magic, you don't need to do that because they can't see now. So that means you can do, for an example, bottle through table on every table and it's always going to be a surprise to them every time they see it because oh, and uh, this brings me to another point imagine what it does to a room you're sat in uh, at a table you're having a meal and then you keep seeing these tables standing up you're going what's going on over there have you seen this why is that table there well, they're, all, they're all stood up why are they all clapping why are they oh they're all cheering now or they're all laughing I can't What's going on? What is it? What's going on? What is it? What's the magician? Oh, what? It's a magician. Get, let's get him over here. Let's get him over here. So then all of a sudden it creates this buzz because everyone keeps seeing these tables going. And now what happens is every, the room gets jealous. Now they're getting jealous. That never happens to magician. You never get people getting jealous. Now you're getting jealous. Now they want you to come over and they want to stand up, right? So I, I actually couldn't believe this because I, I, I actually did a gig um, ages and ages and ages, years ago, years ago. And um, I went and I thought, do you know what? After I've been doing all these, and I'll go for some more points of why I do stand-up magic, but I'll just tell you this one. I thought um, that maybe I was wrong. Maybe the stand-up magic is just in my head and maybe I'm just making it out to be better than what it is, I thought. I don't know. I started to doubt it because I thought, because obviously I had no one to share it with. It was just me and I told other people about it. All the magicians, they didn't get it. They thought it was stupid. It just, they don't understand why. And then I thought, well, maybe they're right. So I went to a table after doing a few stand-up ones and I thought, do you know what? I'm not going to do a stand-up magic. I'm just going to do it normal. And I'm just going to see what the comparison is. So now I'm going to do some table sat down, some table stood up and just see if I am right or wrong. So I went to a table and they were all sat down and I started performing and the guy, I was literally halfway through and he tapped me on my shoulder and he went, excuse me. I was like, yeah. He went, he went, why can we, why are we not stood up like that other table was stood up over there? It says, and he, he said, we, he said, we want what they got. And I went, I said, and I said, and I literally couldn't believe it. I went, hang on. I said, you want me to show you what they saw? Which was the exact same set, but they didn't know at this point because they couldn't see it. And I went, they went like, yeah. And I said, what? Do you, you mean you guys, you, you want to stand up? And they were like, yeah, we want to see what they saw. And I went, okay, so you want to stand up? And they were like, yes. I said, I said, all right, well, stand up then. And they all stood up. And I'm just thinking, what is going on? What is going on? They actually asked me to stand up for what? At that point, I think at that point was when okay, yeah, this is this is definitely this is a this is something. This is definitely something. And in the same performance, I couldn't believe this either. Um, another thing about it is, you know, when you perform at a table and then you're just about to produce a card out of the mystery box or whatever you've got, whatever card to whatever box or whatever, right? You just about to do it. You're going, guys, this box has been here the whole entire time. I've not touched it. And then, boom, food starts coming down. And as you know, the waiters, they do not give a shit. They're not going to stop. They're not going to wait. And why should they? They've got a job. <clears throat> their job is to put the plates on the table because it's hot food. That's their job, right? But they, they're not being rude, but um, they're, they're fucking up your trick without knowing that they are, right? So the food comes down, bang, 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 bang. And now everyone's lost. Everyone's, and then you can't, you, you've got two choices. You can either A, <clears throat> try to bring their attention back to the box, but it's really difficult now because that lady over there wants more fucking potatoes, right? And she's going, catch some more potatoes, please. You know, I'm thinking, well, that's, you know, it's lost, isn't it? You can't, or you go, do you know what, guys? I'm going to leave that box there. I'm going to put it underneath the glass. I'll let you have your tea. I'll come back or whatever, right? But either way, it's crap. 
So it's, but this is what happened. The same table had told me who wanted to stand up. I'm performing and I noticed the weight is coming round, but they couldn't get in. They couldn't put the plates down because everyone stood up. And don't forget, the chairs are just slightly behind them. So this is the person, the chairs just behind them. So the waiters are going, got that right. And I'm thinking, holy shit, the waiters, they can't get in. I thought, this is brilliant. So, but I didn't, I didn't tell them, well, this, this is crazy. This, this, this happened. This 100% happened. The guy trying to get in, and I was just about to go, okay, the waiters are here. At least it gives you a few seconds to go, guys, I'm going to pause it right there. Your food is just here as if by magic. I'm going to let you sit down, have your food, and I'll come back to you uh, in due course. Thank you very much. I'm Tom Wright. Good night. At least it gives you those few seconds. So everyone go up, blah, 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 blah. everyone sits down, then they get food. In, then you have, now you've, you've, you've still got a round of applause and you've been able to walk away as opposed to food coming down and then you awkwardly walking away and there's no applause, there's nothing. And it just looks like, you just feel like you failed. So I'm about to just go, your food's here, blah, you can sit down. And I couldn't believe it. And this has never happened. And I feel like I'm probably the only magician on the planet this has ever happened to. And this is because of stand-up magic. I couldn't believe it. Honestly, it was mental. So in this scenario, the whole venue was getting the same food. It was, um, it was like a Christmas thing. So you, everyone, was getting the, everyone was getting the same three things. And I'm about to say it. And the guy on my right literally turns around to all the waiters with all the plates of food. And he goes, excuse me, mate, can you serve another table? We're just trying to watch magic. And turns back. <laughs> right, I couldn't believe it. And I'm literally stood there going, what the actual hell just happened? I thought, that's never happened to a magician before. No one's ever told the service to go away because they're watching magic. It's the other way I thought, Holy crap, what this is this is insane. That's down that can't have happened. I've never known anyone. Have you has that ever happened to you? Nope, never. I couldn't believe it. So at that point, I was just like, okay, so this is this is this is something. Again, at this point, I still didn't quite know what I had. I just knew I had something. I knew there was something good about it. I didn't quite know. And after so that's another good point. I obviously wouldn't recommend telling the service to go to bugger off. I obviously tell them that the food's here. You can sit down, I'm Tom Wright, good night. I'll come back to you if I can later on. Or we just get time to wrap up. Oh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, fine. Oh, I don't know what happened there. Um, yeah, so it just gives you time to just to wrap up whatever you, whatever you need to wrap up. Um, and uh, another good thing is photos. Imagine photos, you know, when you're performing at a table and everyone stood up and everyone's doing this and a photographer stands on a chair and gets a bird's eye view of that shot. What does that look like? That looks amazing. It looks like you're getting a standing ovation. Yeah. Now I've got photos like that. It's not a standing ovation, it's stand up magic. But any, to anyone else, when they go on your website and they go, oh, this guy's got a lot of, look, he's getting all these standing ovations, look. Mm -hmm. Who was the other magician you were looking at? Well, he hasn't got any standing ovation. This guy has, look up. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, though, isn't it? It's true. So there's that. But on top of that, it, it's a great photo. It, it looks really good because a photographer has to stand on a chair to order to get that really nice thing. And photographers, they don't care. They'll stand on anything to get the shot. Um, so that looks great. Um, oh, so angles are fantastic. So not just from perspective, but you from you as a performer. So from their vision, I think it ultimately looks better. So for instance, if um, if I talk about, I know I'm talking about Chop Cup again, but it's a good one to mention. So if I'm sat at a table and uh, you that this the eyes going down look loads better than the eyes going like this 
Yeah. It just theatrically looks better, especially when you produce the, the tennis ball and the ball. On top of that, it's a lot easier to do things like card in, card in, uh, card in mouth or card on forehead because there's a bigger distance for their eyes to look up. Um, especially what you can do as well, because you've got everyone there, you can get everyone to put their, you can do so many different things. You can get everyone to put their hands on the table or everyone crowd in. So everyone's now crowded in. And I don't do card in the mouth. I do card in the forehead. Now, if everyone was sat down, it wouldn't work. There's no way on earth, if I go to a table of 10, on the very slim chance, if I stick a card to my forehead, I might get the table. I'd have to be lucky. I have to get my misdirection really, really good. But if I have everyone stood up and everyone lean in, when I put that card on my forehead, no one sees it, not one person. So then at the moment when I spread the cards and it's not, the card's not there and they look up and they see that card on the, your forehead, the whole table screams. And that is only possible with stand-up magic. You just won't be able to do it, especially if it's a really big table, a really big round table. You're never going to get that card in your mouth, but have the whole table. You might, you obviously, you'll get him and you'll get him and you maybe you get them too, but you won't get those guys at the back. But again, Another one with chop cup, I put the ball on top of the cup. Now, when I, if I do it when they're sat down, I don't have much. Um, I might get away with it 50% of the time with the ball on top of the cup. I mean, you secretly get the ball on the top of the cup, but they don't know. Whereas if they stood up, you're talking like more like 95% of the time I will full the whole table and no one will see me get that ball on top of the cup and it's the same reaction when they because they're looking at you they can't see that and you're talking to this person here so everyone here is looking at that person you're all on the same level so don't forget they're not looking down here they're not looking at that ball there whereas and these are obviously these are the rise right just in case you're wondering what's that so if you imagine this is the ball on top of the cup right and these are their eyes. Well, look at the distance between these eyes and the ball, yeah? Whereas if they were sat down, all they've got to do is they're just going to see that ball on top of the yeah. cup straight away. You know what I mean? And it's, it, it, and it's, more, it's, all in, it's more in their blind spot. Even though they're looking at you, I can see that red ball. But the, diff but the difference is it's more like it's just... It, I know you can't sort of do it, but yeah, it's different. So... The angles are great. Also, you feel a lot closer to people. So normally if everyone sat down, if I um, was to offer someone a card, I'd only really offer a card to the person on the right or person to the left, maybe the other person in. Everyone stood up. I can now go a little bit further. I can go to like the third or the fourth person in. So now these people at the back feel so much more involved. Body blocking is great. Again, because... You, all you've, got to, all you've got to think about is stand-up magic. This is, this is it in a nutshell. If you think about stand-up magic, all it is is imagine that you're doing a walk-around gig. You're just doing a walk-around gig, but there just happens to be a table in front of you. That is what stand-up magic is. That's all it is. You're doing a walk-around gig. You've got a crowd of people stood up. just happens to be a table in the center. That's what stand-up magic is. And when you realize that, then you go, right, you now can do every single magic trick you have in your set. There is now not a trick that you can't do. Whereas normally when you go to a table, just certain tricks don't work because they're too small. Whereas now all those small tricks also play just as big as the other table tricks that you had as well. So that's it in a nutshell. But your angles are a lot better. Um, as you know, you know when you're doing walk around magic. Yeah. If you're doing like the tilt, you know you're doing uh, the tilt in a walk around situation. It's great, isn't it? Because everyone's eyes are pointing down, right? Yeah. yeah. As soon as you, as soon as you're going to a table and they're sat down, now their eyes are here. So the problem is you've got to arch your wrist up yeah. so they can see the illusion that the card is going in the middle. Because if you do it like that, they're not going to see the illusion of the card going in the middle. But, so that's why you've got to do this. But of course, if they're all stood up, then now what happens is you're not doing this. 
you're doing this. And now your arm is stretched out and everyone's looking down. So that's it. There's, there's loads of other benefits for it, but um, that's, uh, that's some benefits in, in a nutshell. Again, I've probably waffled on. To no, me. you haven't. It's amazing. And I'm, I hope that everybody tries this because the first time I tried it, I was blown away. And you put a load of routines and a load of ideas on a DVD, called it Stand Up Magic, and it's one of the best DVDs out there if you haven't seen it. Um, and people do need to do this. Now, let me ask you a question, Tom. Okay. Going back in time a little bit. So you've gone full-time pro. You've decided to become a full-time professional. You're doing mainly close-up magic. Yep. When I first met you, obviously, David Penn introduced the two of us. And I think we yep. met at Dave Penn's house. When I met you, you were already doing very high-end close-up work. You weren't struggling for work. You were already kind of dominating your area in both the wedding and the corporate market. For anybody watching this, have you got any advice on how to go from having a doing this semi-professionally? Because that your journey is the same journey of a lot of magicians. I get so many people on this channel saying to me, hey, I've got a full-time job. I'm doing magic semi-professional. I'm doing the old gig here and there. I want to make it my full-time job. And this is something that you've actually done. This is a journey that you've done and you've done really successfully. So is there any advice that you can give on how to go from doing magic semi-professionally to being a professional magician at the top of their game okay so number one um always be the nice guy always be the nice guy even um when you don't want to be always be the nice guy um because um clients will remember that forever and they'll always come back to you because of that um, always do a little bit longer than what you should. Don't leave on time. Um, if you're there for, if you're booked for two hours, do a little bit more than two hours. They will remember it. I've always done that. If someone's booked me for two, I've always done two and a half. Someone booked me for three, I always do three and a half hours. Always do a little bit more than what you should do. Um, turn up well in time for your booking every single time. Um, you have to tell really early, 30 minutes, 45 minutes early to the most. Get out there as much as you can. Um, do lots of wedding fairs. Um, I shouldn't say that because you might be getting onto my reputation um, uh, on my patch. Um, just get yourself out there. Meet people. Talk to people. Um, you get to know networking organizations, didn't you? Which is where you met Brad. Yes, that's another thing I was going to mention. Do a lot of networking. Networking really, really works. But the only way networking works is if you keep doing it. The problem is some people say networking doesn't work. Um, the reason why they say it doesn't work is because they've tried it six times. And out of those six times, they didn't get any work. Well, that's why it hasn't worked. You've got to keep going. And sometimes it might take a up three four months for you to get a gig out of it some not it might you might get a gig straight away you might be really lucky um but sometimes it takes time but once you've built those relationships from those three months that's when the work starts to trickle in and then you notice oh i'm getting a few gigs here and then you get more gigs coming in because everyone's talking about you everyone's got to know you You've been the nice guy. People like you. People have got to like you. You've got to be liked to, to, to get the work. If they think you're a really nice guy, you know, you, you know, you don't have to be. You can be a total, you can be a total asshole, but they don't need to know that. Just be a nice guy. Right. And uh, and um, but no, just just be always a nice guy. And um, yeah, you won't go far wrong. Uh, is there anything else you want to know on that? So yeah, networking, do a lot of networking, do lots of wedding fairs. Uh, just get out there and meet people. The more people know your name, the more work you're going to get. Um, and just, just keep doing it. Um, you never know. Who, you always have a bit of magic on you because you never know who you're going to meet. I, I've always tried not to take magic out with me. And I know that's the wrong thing to do because I just want to not, I just don't want to perform. I just want to relax and just be me. But to be honest, Every time I have had magic on me and I have met someone, that a lot of the time turns into a gig. In fact, you might find that if you've got, especially in the beginning, 
you can get a gig anywhere. You really can. You can, I've got a gig shopping in Tesco's before, you know, so always have a bit of magic on you anywhere you go, because um, like I've been at where I've been to a restaurant and um, same thing, I had some magic with me. What I would do is don't, the best way, if you're going to a, a restaurant, let's say you want to work in a restaurant, right? And there's a restaurant that you really like, or there's a bar or something or whatever. Don't go in there and try to impress um, the manager. Don't do that. Best thing to do is go in there with your friends or people you know and impress them. So then what happens is, same thing happened to me. We went for a, um, some food in a restaurant. And I had no, I didn't have plans to work there at all. But I had plans to impress the friends who are going. Because there was a few people going who didn't know me. So um, a few people saw, can you take? So I, I had loads of magic on me. They had no idea. And anyway, I did loads of magic. They were all screaming. Of course, the staff and the manager of the restaurant going, what is going on over there? They learned that there was a magician over there. Then they're like, oh, and then I showed them some magic and then they booked me and they booked me for a regular night to go in there. So that me just going in there and just having a laugh and showing some magic turned into a gig. So, you know, that's probably the best thing to do, isn't it? And because you'll find that if you impress your friends or strangers, it, the manager will come to you. You won't have to go to the manager. If you go to the manager, go, oh, I'm a magician, blah, blah, blah. It might work. But what would be better is if you go into their venue unannounced, you start impressing everyone. Everyone's talking. You just, magician, 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 magician. Now the staff are like, what magician? Then you show the staff some magic. And then before you know it, the manager's like, what's going on? Why is everyone talking about magician? I need to see this guy. Boom, you've got a gig. Perfect. Absolutely perfect. Brilliant advice. People need to listen to that 100%. Um, now, where did, where did, right. So you're a successful close-up magician. Then at yeah. some point you decide to start creating magic. Yeah. So let's talk about that process because that's something that a lot of magicians don't do. A lot of magicians become full-time, become close-up magicians, stage magicians, whatever. And they're happy with that. You started creating magic, and I think the first trick you ever released was chill. Yep. So where did where did the idea of creating magic come about? Uh, because obviously, and we're going to get to this a little bit later on. We're going to talk about gravity, but you you are well known as being a user of invisible thread. You know, I, I don't know what that is. You know, you you you, you yeah, are. Yeah, I float stick you're, you're you're one of the best and chill i'll tell people now that are watching it i still think to this day it's probably the best haunted deck there is out there it's incredible um, so where, where, i yeah yeah where did i, I agree on that about the chill thing um i know it's my own and i'm being biased but i do actually believe chill is it, it's still it's perfect as it is it doesn't need to be changed it's it's yeah it's great um i didn't want to do thread um Thread sort of just accidentally happened. I the first time I was really introduced to thread stuff is I went to Black Pole Magic Convention and uh, Bruno Copin, who's a thread master legend, uh, on his stand, and he was doing the butterfly effect. Have you seen the butterfly? Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Blew my mind when I saw that. I was like, I didn't know it was thread. And um, I had no idea how it was done. And I was like, was that, obviously I knew what IT was. I knew, I, I knew what IT was, but he did it so well, you couldn't tell it was IT. In fact, I dragged my friend over and said, you gotta watch this, you gotta watch this. And he was like, it's IT. I said, it's not IT. I've had it done on myself. It wasn't IT. And of course it was IT. Uh, and I fell in love with it there. And I, um, I fell in love with, with IT right there and then. And then it was shortly after I was uh, playing around with um, different haunted decks from different creators. And then I just had this light bulb moment of, I wonder if um, I could do a haunted deck in their hands using thread. I thought, how would, that, how would that work? And then I don't know where it came from. It was just a light bulb. It came in my mind, I came up with a hookup and it worked. And I thought, wow, that's, and I thought that must have been that was too easy. That must have been have done before. And, um, you know, I kind of made my own destiny, really. 
with bringing out products. And I think that's what you've got to do in life. You've got to make your own destiny. 100%. You think about what you want to do. And then you kind of throw pebbles into the water and make ripples, you know, and then you, uh, so that's kind of what I did. I, I wanted to, I didn't know, I, I knew I wanted to create magic or I wanted to be known or something. The question is, why, why did you start creating magic? Because before Chill came yeah. out, the only yeah. haunted decks that there were really around there, there was an electronic one from the, that nobody really used. There was Nick Einhorn's yeah. thing, which hasn't been around. Yeah, spooked. Yeah, spooked. And, yeah. and there was like the old fishing wire type thing that sold in joke shops and stuff. You created this thing that made the haunted deck practical. Absolutely practical yeah. done in real world situations. You could put that on show reels and just like milk it forever and have that as your thing, but you decided to share it with the community. Where did that desire to not just so you've created chill, you have the idea of having this haunted deck, it's freaking amazing, but you then decide to then go, Well, I'm gonna release this so that everybody can do it. I want to know yeah. why you did that. You didn't need to. To be clear for everybody watching this, you were successful as it was. You were a successful yeah. person magician you weren't worried about getting gigs you weren't short of money you weren't worried about paying the mortgage it's not like you needed a kickback from a from a project in order to pay the mortgage that month that's not the case yeah. so well yes start releasing magic uh okay so what ha what happened was um in in a nutshell so i created chill and i'd uh, all it was is there was no gimmick it was just one str one strand of thread with two bits of putty on the end and that was the gimmick um, but the only problem with that was it, it was a pain in the ass because if it snapped, then I've got to do it again. And a lot of the time I would get the measurement wrong because the measurement had to be perfect. And then um, it was a, just a bit of a nightmare. But the whole up was sound. The trick was sound. But if it snapped, it was a nightmare. So I went out and started doing gigs with this um, with and doing chill. And then I was driving down south and I was going past Whale Magic Shop. And I thought, oh, I've never been there. I'll, or I think I had been there once and I'll call in. And what I'll do is, oh, I, thought, I just had this idea. I thought I'll go into Whale Magic Shop and I'm going to try and fool them with thread. And I'm not going to tell them it's thread. I'm just going to tell them that it's a real haunted deck and I can just do it with like my mind or something like that I thought I don't know why I was kind of a stupid idea but I was going past there for a gig and I thought I'll drop in have a look at some magic and then maybe do this chill thing um and see if I can fool them with it that was it that's all I was doing so I went in there and I was looking at a few things and um the guy behind the counter I forgot his name he used to wear it there um I said uh I sort of wangled the conversation onto haunted decks. So I kind of turned the conversation around on myself. I tried to sort of just manipulate him kind of to talk about haunted decks, which I did. And then I just went, oh, actually, I do a, I do a haunted deck, but it doesn't use anything. It doesn't use IT, it doesn't use any electronics. It just uses a pack of cards and then me. And he was like, oh, really? Oh, yeah. And, I, and then he said, um, he said, can you do it now? And yeah, I said, have you got a pack of cards? So I'm playing, I'm, I'm playing it totally blatant. And obviously, so he gives me the deck and I do it on him. He freaks out. He couldn't, he can't believe it. And he, to him, it was the same thing. The same feeling he had was when I saw Bruno Coca, because I didn't think it was IT. In my mind, it was like, this is not IT. I know it's not IT. This is amazing. I have no idea how it's done. And then I got my friend and said, it's not IT, it's not IT, I know it's not. So that's the kind of thing he was doing in his mind. Then he gets someone else who is there, you got to watch this, you got to watch this. And then um, Dave Penn comes through and watches it and it fooled, it fooled them all. It definitely fooled them all. So yeah, it, it fooled them all. They had no idea how it was, how it was done. And it was, a great, it was a great feeling to think that they they even though yes i i lied i white lied i said it wasn't threat but the thing is it does to me it doesn't matter because they believed it so that in my mind i i must have done it that well that they couldn't see the thread they believed me it wasn't thread 
And to them, that was it. So that, to me, in my mind, I fooled them, even though I said it wasn't thread, because they couldn't see it and they couldn't figure it out. And even if it was thread, they couldn't figure out the hook up. Because with chill, your hands are so free to move around. You just look at it and go in, well, there's no thread there because he's moving his hands all over. And there is, there's nothing attached to your hands ever. So that's what's cool about chill. And then Jim Trainer, the late Jim Trainer, as we both know, um, great guy. Uh, he knew it was thread, but no one else did. And then I walked out the shop, I was thinking, wow, I'll tell you, fooled them all, it was great. And then Jim came out and he, he said, oh, Tom, um, I, know, I know it's IT. I went, ah, oh, damn. He was, I said, and he said, I didn't see it, I just worked it out, but they all, he said, none of them all know it is. So it's brilliant. And then he said, can you actually do it with this? And he had a little gimmick. He said, can you do it with this? And I said, I don't know. I said, I don't know. I thought, maybe not. I, I'm not sure. I said, I'll take it home and practice with it. And I thought, eh, I don't know. And I went home, practiced it. It turned out this gimmick just happened to be the perfect gimmick for chill. It was like made for my haunted deck. And I thought, wow, because it's great. You can easily get the length really easy. It's dead easy to apply. It's 10 times easier to apply than how I was doing it originally. If it snaps, not a problem because I can reel out some more. I thought this is brilliant. And it was really, it was 10 times a faster setup. My setup was a right pain and it took ages to do it. And if you got it wrong, you have to do it all again. It was a nightmare. So then, and then Dave Penn rings me up, says, right, do you want to bring out this chill? Well, it didn't have a name at the time. Um, and I said, yeah, okay, why not? And then that was it. And then that was it. It was born. And then I was a thread guy. So that's where, and then the same thing happened again. Um, I, I, I tell you, I, I think I'm pretty, I tell you, I'm, tell you what I'm good at. It's, I'm not good at inventing things. I'm good at if someone gives me something and tells me, can you do something with this? That's where I'm no good at inventing something, but if someone goes, hey, can you do something with this? Then I can turn it into something amazing. And that's where my creativity works there. So it's a bit different. Um, so that's, that same thing happened with Kinetic. You know, they said, can you do it with this? Or what can you do with this? I was like, oh, I can do it. And then it came up with Oblivion. So I got given things and then I made them. So the, yeah. That's it. That's where, that's where it was born. But I never wanted to be thread. I always wanted to be my, I've always done comedy. I've always done comedy. I've always been an entertainer. I've always been wanted to be on stage. That to me was what I've always been since I was a kid. Since I was a kid, I've always been the class clown. Whereas the problem with, with IT for me was, was that I, it's too, obviously it's serious. I can't do comedy with make it, doing a haunted deck doesn't work, does it? I can't be making people, it's got to be totally serious. So when I first came on the scene, I don't think people realized that I was a funny guy. I think people just thought I was a serious guy doing thread. In actual fact, that was like, that's not me at all, but I can't help, I, I, for some reason, I'm, I don't know why, but for some weird reason, I am good with IT. I don't know why I am, I don't know why. I, it makes no sense. But for some reason, I can work out things that other people can. And I don't know why that is. It, it, it's, it's bizarre, to be honest. I don't know. It's weird, strange. You bought a whole bunch of stuff out with World Magic Shop, Kinetic and Oblivion and, and Stand Up yeah. Magic and stuff like that. And, and all very well received by the magic community. And then you go and set up your own production company with Aaron. Yes. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, we've only brought out a couple of things. We've actually got one other thing. Um, was only brought out. What was the reason behind that? Was it because I know you and Aaron are close, and I, I you know, yeah. I, mean, I don't really know Aaron as well as I know you. Uh, I, I've seen stuff that he's done that I like, but you know, you you guys kind of then suddenly kind of from going and bringing all of this stuff out, it was like, well, you know, now I'm going to have my own production company, and now I'm going to bring stuff out myself. It was kind of a yeah. I just it felt it felt like it was um, the right thing to do. It felt like it was the next step. I thought I liked the idea of producing it all and uh, making it all and sort of standing on your, it was basically kind of like leaving the nest. It was like, right, I've done this, but I reckon I can fly on my own. I want to stand on my own two feet. I had visions of having my own stand at Blackpool, things like this. 
And I just wanted to be, in the, I think it was just basically independent. That's all it was. Independent, standing around two feet. Can I do this? Flying away from the nest. That's basically what it is. Um, but, I put some great stuff out with Aaron. Yeah, we brought, we've brought out two things. We brought out um, Collision, which is a fork stab of a card. And then we brought out Completely Mental, which is um, a DVD on um, not mentalism. I think people think because it's called Complete Mental, it's all mentalism. Uh, it's actually not. It's just that me and, me and Aaron are totally mental. Um, and we're, when we get together, we're just not all there. So that's why we call it Complete Mental. But yeah, it's, it's all a mixture of things. It's got a great um, story deck on there, which is really, really good. Um, and it's got West well, lots of other things but we have got one other thing that we are going to be bringing out we haven't brought anything out for ages uh, but we have got something on the cards it's ready to be we've got the products we just need to film it and um but obviously because of the pandemic we couldn't film it so now the pandemic starts to relax a little bit more um we can uh, start filming hopefully at the end of this month uh, we'll be able to film the new product. So that's exciting. Are you planning on carrying on doing other stuff with Aaron? Um, po possibly. What, what, we, what we decided was what we're going to do is we're only going to bring out products that are joint efforts. And then we're going to do um, <clears throat> independent stuff by ourselves. So uh, was because Collision was just, it was basically mine and then I brought it out, me and Aaron brought it out. Collision was a joint effort, but now we're thinking, actually, we're just going to do joint efforts. Okay. Um, so this next product, again, was both of our thinkings that we've thought of. So we're bringing that again together. So uh, And obviously, you've done <coughs> lots of other stuff. You've worked with Murphy's. You've done stuff with Penguin. You've, uh, uh, you've brought more stuff out through World Magic Shop. And then all of a sudden... And I don't want to talk about this too much because obviously we did a we did a whole review oh, yes. show interview on it a few weeks we did. ago. But, but how did how did I mean he's a big name? Yeah, well Miranda's a big name, a huge name, and he doesn't work with many people. In fact, the person he worked with before you was Kayla Morelli on the on the metal phone. So I mean, you're following in big, huge, massive shoes. How did that come about? How did it come about that there's this guy that's one of the most prolific creators of just like he's the Q of the magic world. And, and now all of a sudden your name and his name are linked. Did you make the call? Did he make the call? Where did all that come from? Um, it was, well, basically how, how we first started talking originally was I had his smoke cube and um, something wasn't quite working right with the smoke cube. Um, and I contacted him and his customer service is excellent. I sent it straight back to him. He, he, uh, he sent me a brand new one straight away. He, made, he sent me a brand new one straight away. And on top of that, he fixed my old one. So I actually had, I actually had two. I was like, hang on, he fixed my old one and he sent me a new one. I was like, wow, that's amazing. So he's, he was really good at stuff like that. Um, and then we got chatting and he's, he mentioned whilst we were talking about this, he said, oh, I saw your penguin lecture, which I was like, what? I was a bit gobsmacked when he said that. I was like, you watched my, you watched my penguin lecture? And he went, yeah, he thought it was really funny. And he, um, he liked all my effects. And then he said, I would love to work with you on something hopefully in the future. And I was like, yeah, sure. And then we, we bounced some ideas around um, and nothing came to fruitation. Well, in actual fact, I said, what about this idea? And he said, no, I don't like it. And I said, what about this idea? And he went, no, I don't like it. So I kept throwing him ideas and he went, no, I'm just rubbish, Tom. I was like, all right. And then, and then about um, it was a year and a half, I don't even know now, a year, a year and a half, it was a year and a half ago, um, just over a year ago, um, uh, he was going to bring out he was thinking about bringing out a thread reel. And um, I think he was talking to Dave Penn. I think Dave Penn reminded him, um, saying, oh, you know, um, obviously Tom and his thread work. And then I think that made Joanne go, oh, yes, hang on, because, you know, I was talking to Tom. So he came back to me and said, Tom, I'm thinking about um, creating this thread reel. Do you want to uh, jump on and maybe made it, make it with me, come up with some effects. And I was like, yeah, okay. And then boom, that was it. That's how it started. 
Uh, and then we went back and forth of what he said. What first of all, he said, what do you want it to do? And I said, I want it to do this. I want it to do that. And we went back and forth on the design. And I, I actually made a lot of changes on this as well. I moved things around and said, that needs to be there. And um, so, yeah, it was really, really good. And then he sent me a prototype once it was all done. And I couldn't, I, I, I am really uh, proud of all the effects that I've actually come up with because there's, I didn't think I would have come up with this many. In fact, I've only just come up with something, uh, well, it was a few weeks ago now, but I, I came up with something new that's already gone onto the project. And I keep thinking about new things all the time that are gonna, the great thing is if I come up with something, I can then add it to the instructions. So more videos, and don't forget, on this, there are 20 plus effects taught. I don't think there's ever been anything like that. Well, not for a, th not for a thread reel. I don't know any other thread reel out there that's said, here's 20 effects that you can do with this. And there's going to be more. Um, 15 of them are mine, and five of them, six of them are someone else's. Um, but, um, but yeah, so yeah, there's a lot. I think that was, was, was there anything else? I've, I've, I've... No, it's, I mean, it's been so well received by the magic community. Obviously, people can go back and watch the interview that we did on Gravity. Uh, Absolutely. But it's something that, uh, and I'll, I'll link that in the description down below, but it's something that, you know, you, you must be very proud of. You must be very proud of that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, I hope uh, me and Joanne bring something else out uh, in the future, which could also possibly happen again. So this could happen again. Obviously, it won't be a thread. It'll be something else. Uh, but now, uh, very exciting times ahead. And I also know that um, I'll also be at Blackpool next year and I will be on Joanne's stand and I will be demoing Gravity. Oh, um, um, yeah, I'll be demoing Gravity all day for three days. So that's going to be really, really cool as well. That's amazing. Now, I want to go back to you as a performer. Because obviously, the one thing I want to talk about that we haven't touched on really is you work. You you've made that transition to performing on stage. You know, we've talked all about how you've been a close-up performer along. In fact, I seem to remember you and Dave Penn teaming up as close-up magicians. I'm sure at some point you had a website where it was, a, and it was such a well-done website where it was you and <laughs> Dave almost arguing with each other. There was like a little you and there was a little Dave and I forgot about that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, we did. Um, although it just didn't, it, it didn't work out in the end. Um, it just didn't work out. It was a great idea, but not a great idea. Uh, but yeah, the website was brilliant. But in the end, things went wrong and we decided to scrap it. But we still work together all the time. We, we, we pass work back and forth to each other time now. Um, but yeah, that, that didn't work. But um, making the transition from did you say, sorry, did you say the transition yeah. from close up to stage? Yeah, or? because I get that question an awful lot. And I've spoken to people about it on this channel before. I've spoken to people like John Archer about it. I've spoke to people yeah. like Mark Spellman, Faye Presto. Uh, it's a question that comes up again and again. How, as a, it's the holy grail, isn't it? Close up magicians want to go and perform on stage as performers. I know. It took me. Scary as hell. There's a big difference between performing to five people at a garden yeah. party and walking out on stage in front of a thousand people on a cruise liner like you do or a big corporate event. So, what? Well, how did it happen? How did it happen? Any advice? Yeah. It took me ages took me ages and I failed and died on stage every single time and every time I died on stage a little part of my soul died <laughs> that is true and it was heartbreaking because all I've ever wanted to do since I was a child was to be on stage and perform not all the thing there's a few things I haven't mentioned about the origin story I forgot um yeah because I did go to college and I did do drama so obviously I was used to be on stage and playing a part as an actor and doing co comedic roles and during since I've been a magician 
uh, I've all I also stepped back into acting and I did a few amateur dramatics where we did um, like two weeks and a lot of the time I was always leading leading comedy role which was great so I kind of kept my foot in um, the acting world a little bit because I thought you know I don't want to lose those skills as an actor but what what I couldn't understand was I thought, how can I go on stage as an actor and have the whole audience crying with laughter in tears but i struggle to get one laugh as a stage magician or i just struggle with nerves badly why is it not working i don't get it i do a play yes the play has been directed that's one thing two you've got lines that have been pre-written but still the performance i'm still performing that's getting that the audience to like the character and love the character and laugh with the character why can't i do that in acting why is it not working what and a lot of the time was um the reason why it didn't work is because i was trying to be someone else and i wasn't trying to be me i for some reason i was trying to be like darren brown and it obviously didn't work at all people knew that i couldn't read minds they just took one look at me when you can't read minds right and um <laughs> So, and I think I, what I did is I bought, uh, what, I, what I didn't realize in the beginning was I was buying really expensive stuff um, and it just didn't work in my performance. Like I think I bought, um, it was by Promistic and it was called from Bobby Mutters um, and it was these uh, five plastic glasses. You couldn't see inside them, they were all black. And then they all had different drinks in. And then when they took a drink, you know what, you're blindfolded and you know what they're drinking. You go, right, you've got Pepsi, that, that's orange. You, you, you have, uh, so I think I, I, I bought that, tried it, didn't work, and it just like died. And I think I bought, um, I can remember buying Stretching the Truth, uh, which the giraffe one, I can remember buying that. Uh, which I now do, and I absolutely love it. But when I first bought it, um, I died with that, and and I was trying to, um, I was trying to do it word for word or emulate the the original performer, and I was trying to add my own little spin. I just couldn't get it working. But what really killed it for me, why I stopped trying, was. I tried a couple of these things and kind of got a little bit something. I'm thinking, and I can remember buying a floating table. I did a floating table, but the problem was I, I didn't have a route. I didn't have like, um, the, the main reason why it didn't work for me is because I had no opener. I didn't introduce my character. I just went on, did that trick and then walked off and it made no sense. It just, just, it was just, it was just awful. That's why it didn't work. And I was, again, floating table, that's not going to work for my character. You know, the drinking the cups, that's not going to work for me. I was trying all these things that were all wrong for me. Um, but what killed it for me was I, I, I got this gig um, and I said to them, I can do 15 minutes on stage. And I think I was maybe 25, 26. And I thought, right, I want to make the transition to, I want to do more stage stuff. And I'd learned um like three tricks and i think one of them was um the joke i thought i'll do this joke at the start you know when you get a rope, piece of rope and i think i forgot oh, who's it by you might know he cuts the rope up into loads of tiny little pieces and he talks about he saw a magician once and he cuts up and cuts up and cuts up and then he restores it and then he goes i don't know how he did it and as he drops all the bits onto the table and it's like a comedy moment um i i do know it. he'll come back to me and i thought i'll do that that's funny um now i probably don't know if i was allowed to do that but i was young you know and then i was going to do um echo by wayne dobson which kind of did suit me um and i'd been learning it and learning it all um for for weeks and i was still i was still living at my mum's house at this time right? Oh, I was back a little bit. Was kind of, you know. And then, and then um, I, uh, I went on and I did the rope thing and it didn't get a laugh at all. 
the whole room was, and I thought, oh no. So I've been on, done this, let go of the rope. There wasn't one laugh. In fact, there was a, <coughs> there was a cough. There was a, and I thought, and I thought, shit. I thought, it was, it was dire. And then I thought, okay, okay, I'll get in with Echo. Echo is a saving grace. This is going to be great. And then I got the kit. I got, I, I looked around the room and I picked the totally the wrong person. And I don't know why I did this. So everyone was fairly older and there was a young kid in the audience. So he was about 18. So I thought, okay, we're kind of on, maybe, maybe not 18, maybe you sort of like 16, 17. And he was kind of same, not same age, but we were, we were the younger what we were the younger kids in the uh, obviously I was 25 or whatever, 24. I don't actually know what age I was. Um and then I thought, oh, I'll pick him. He's a bit younger, which is probably the wrong thing to do. I should have picked one of the older people. And I picked him up and all, I, f- I forgot what the routine was, but I hand him the pack of cards. And I think this pack of cards was set up in a certain way or like the top card was or something. I can't remember what, how it was. But I give him the cards and I think all he had to do was cut them or do something, something really simple. And I give him the cards and I do not know of why he did this to this day. As soon as I give him, him, he looked at me, he looked at the pack, and he just sprung them all over the stage. So I had no backup. That was my last trick. So I did the rope thing, which killed. Everyone, no one'd laugh. I got the kid up, I'm just about to do echo. I thought this would be great, this would be dead funny. Give him a pack of cards, and for some reason, he just on purpose springs them all over the stage. Now this card's all over the stage. I can't come back from that. It was the first time I'd really, I'd, and I think that was the, that was the last straw at me trying stage. I thought, I'm not doing this again. And I can remember just saying to the audience, I'm really sorry about that, guys. Um, I'm just gonna pick up these cards and I'll, uh, I'll and at this point, I hadn't been, I hadn't even been around the tables. So they don't even know that I'm good. So at this point, like I knew in my mind, I'm I, at this age, I was kick ass at going around to the tables and blown away and making them all laugh. So at this point, their expectations of me was zero. They just thought this is the worst magician I've ever seen in my entire life. So then I picked up the cards. I said that the booker was like that. The person I can I can remember the guy who booked me in the background. And he's he was doing this oh my whilst I was on, whilst I was on stage, and I thought, and I picked up the cards and I said to the kid, I went, I whispered to him, I said, "Why the hell did you just do that? What are you doing?" He didn't say anything to me. He just didn't say it. He helped me pick up the cards as well. And I was still conf- I was dead confused, and I didn't speak to him again. I thought because his, he was with his parents. So he was like on a family table, which made him worse. He was with his mum and dad and his sister. And I thought that was weird. Anyway, then I went around every table, kind of apologizing, goes basically saying, guys, that I, I know that was rubbish, but I am good. And then I, I kind of won back every table. I don't think I got to 10, but I probably win them back to seven or eight of them thinking, like if you said out of marks out of 10, I think they would say maybe seven out of 10. Maybe I got them back and then um, and then I, I, I left. Um, and then I thought, I'm not, that's it. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it ever again. And that's it. Obviously, obviously stage isn't for me. I can't do it. I'll just stick to close up. And I did. I just took to close up for years. And any time someone mentioned, can you do, I mean, I after that, I had people say, oh, because they really liked my close up and they thought it was funny and they, they loved it. They said, oh, Tom, can you do stage? And I was like, no. I can't, I don't do stage. And I'm like, are you sure? I was like, no, I don't do it. No, wow, not 10 minutes. I was like, no, I don't do, don't do it. Don't do it. And I was, I just shied away from for years, for years and years and years and years. And I went, I'm not doing it. It made my heart go like that. When someone asked me about doing stage, I was just like, there's no way I'm doing it. I died for years. I just obviously can't do it. And it killed me. It was, it was heartbreaking because I knew I inside I wanted to do it. And I knew inside that I would be good at it. I thought, I know that I'm good. At, I know that I can be good. I know I can do it. I know I can do it. But for some reason, I just, it just doesn't work. Why? And then, so this is how it happened. This is how I finally started doing stage. And it's really bizarre, really bizarre. 
Um, so, are you okay with telling you? I'm, I'm not waffling on again, man. You're not what? waffling. I'm loving it. I'm literally, you can't see my seat, but I'm on the edge of it. This is amazing. <laughs> okay. So, what happened was, is um, this is so, men- this is mental. So I can remember, uh, you know, you just get like spam on your email. Uh, and I think I was, how old was I? Because I haven't been doing stage long. I have not been doing stage long. Um, I must have been maybe, maybe six, maybe uh, four or five years ago, five, maybe six years ago. I was about 30 or 31. Hang on. I can't, I'll, I'll, I'm 30, yeah, I was about 30, just nearly six years ago. I'm 36 in June, so it was about, yeah, I was about 30 years old. Um, I think I'll come back to it. Anyway, you know, you get loads of spam in your email or you just get loads of things coming through. And I got something on my email and it said, um, it said, um, uh, welcome to the Yorkshire Business Awards. Grab your seat now. And this whole email was talking about the Business Yorkshire Awards and this was happening and this was happening and blah, 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 blah. And for some reason, I thought I must have somehow signed up for this or said summer or they've obviously got my email. And I knew I did know a couple of them. I went, oh, yeah, yeah, I know him. And it was, I knew it was I was doing a lot of networking. So I realized that a lot of these people that I did networking with were going to this business Yorkshire Awards night. And I thought, all oh, right, that's how they've got my email. Then I've got it from here. Scrolling through it. And I was thinking, do you know what? I reckon if I emailed them because I went, ah, oh, I know. And I realized who one of the organizers, I went, I know him. I said, what I'll do is I'll, eat, I'll ring him up or whatever. And I'll say, do you want me to do some magic around the tables? I thought, might as well. If they've emailed me, I'm going to email them back to see. If they... And that's another good point. If you do get an email about an awards night, give them an email back. I'll give them a call saying, I've just, re- I've just, re- just, received your email about the awards night looks absolutely fantastic uh yeah so i got your email and this one you you know do you want some you know boom they've called you you call that so that's why i look at it anyway so i'm looking through this email and you're not gonna believe this right and then it said right at the bottom it said also hosting the awards is the magical magician tom wright what and a pick and had a picture of me. How, how, how did that happen? Yeah, I know. So at this point, I'm thinking, first of all, A, what the fuck? <laughs> what? I'm thinking, so I'm just stood there looking at the phone going, just trying to like work out what's going on. Like, have I entered like the twilight zone right now? And I thought, hang on a minute, hang on a minute, hang on a minute. I thought, I've looked it back. First of all, it's a good job I opened up that email because if I, a lot of the time, I just delete them, right? But I actually looked at this email at this point and looked through it. If I had not done that, I wouldn't have seen myself on that email, right? And I thought, hosting the awards, magician Tom Wright, I'm thinking, what the hell is going on? I was thinking, hang on a minute, hang on a minute. And I thought, right, what's the date? Have I booked something in and just totally forgotten about it or something? So I looked at the date and I opened my diary. There's nothing in my diary. Nothing, nothing, nothing. I mean, I'm free, but there's not a gig. There's nothing in there. So at this point, I'm like well confused. And then I, um, one of the organizers was also, there was a, a couple of organizers and one of them was my friend called Alan Fenn. And I thought, hang on a minute. Um, I'll just give Alan a call and see uh, what this is all about. I rang him up. And I said, Alan, um, I've just seen, I've just received this email, and it says that you know the award, the Yorkshire Business Awards. He's like, yeah. And I said, it says that I'm, it says that I'm hosting it. And he went, yeah, you are. And I went, what do you mean? I said, I, I said, hang on, I slow down, slow down. I said, I went, how? I said, what do you mean I'm hosting it? When did this? I said, mate, there's nothing in my diary. And then he said, do you know that gig you did for me a year ago? And I was like, yeah. And you went around the tables. I went, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, afterwards we were chatting. I went, yeah, I remember chatting. And I said to you, there's these business awards coming up next year. So how do you fancy about doing them? And then, and I went, yeah, I do remember that. But you didn't book me, Alan. I said, 
the words were, you said to me, how do you fancy doing them? I said, yeah, I would love to. Give me a call when you're ready and we'll book it in. He took that as a booking. <laughs> right? He, he took that, me saying I would love to do them as like, that's confirmed, Tom's booked in. I didn't, and I said, Alan, I said, we haven't even, we haven't confirmed the price. I said, you don't even know what I'm going to charge you. And he went, oh, yeah, well. He said, well, how much do you want then? And I'm thinking, what? I said, you've booked me to do the hosting magic wards. You haven't asked me for any money. You know that I'm going to charge, yet you haven't asked me what I'm going to charge. I'm thinking, mate, you, there's no invoices, no contract, there's nothing. I said, what? I said this, this is in three months' time. I said, and I'm doing these awards. Anyway, uh, I said, okay, I'll do it for X amount. He went, great. I said, right, I'll book it in then. I said, first of all, Anna, I said, I am a bit nervous here because obviously I've never hosted awards before and it's kind of basically being on stage and doing magic on stage. And I said, you know, what do you want me to do? And he said, well, maybe you could do some stage magic and then host an award. Uh, and then we basically worked out that I was going to do some magic, host like three awards, do some magic, host three awards, and then do some magic and then host three awards. And that's it. So I was going to like do like uh, three stints on stage of like five to 10 minutes each. And I agreed to it. And I was like, and at this point, so it was, it was so bizarre of how that happened, but that's how it happened. And I was really nervous because all my worries were coming back about everything. And um, I asked a few magician friends, what should I do? Do you think I should do this, should I do that? And then I, um, I did tossed out deck. I did uh, Bolarama. I did, um, I think I did Slow It Smart Ass. And um, I think I did ball production as well. And even maybe, I can't remember what I did. But anyway, I went on and um, I killed it. Everyone was howling and hissing themselves. I couldn't believe it because it was the first time that it actually worked. It was the first time that um, I went down well, but more than what it was, it was, I don't know what happened, but I went on that stage and there was just, it, it, something clicked and it just worked. And everyone was laughing, rolling around laughing. And I came, what was, came off that stage with such a buzz. Obviously I couldn't believe that for the first time, um, I did it. It was like, it was like, oh, I actually did it. And they loved me. And I was like, holy crap. I thought, what did I do wrong? What did I do? Did, do I must have done something different. I thought, what? And then I realized I knew what I did differently. I was myself. Mm -hmm. That's all it was. I was literally myself. I was taking the piss of the, out the awards. I was taking the Mickey out, the, the names and stuff like that. I wasn't going overboard. I wasn't, over, I wasn't stepping over. I was just being cheeky. But for some reason, it worked. And all those times I was trying to be someone else, whether that I was trying to speak posh or trying to change my voice, um, trying to be David Copperfield, trying to be Darren Brown, trying to be... Um, and well, none of it worked is because I, I wasn't trying to be me. And as soon as I started being myself it just went bang and it just worked. And I was like, holy crap. I said, if that's the secret, it's just to be yourself, then shit. And it worked. And then it went on from there. And then um, I had the buzz from it. And then the year later I did the awards again and it went down. In fact, the, the second time I did it, I think the awards didn't go down quite as well as the first time I did. I think I was trying to be too clever. Um, I don't know. And then I thought, right, I, I still want to pursue this because even though I didn't do as good as the first time, I still did good. Although that's my opinion. I'm very critical of myself. A lot of the time, this happens a lot. I will do a gig and I will walk out my gig and absolutely crucify myself of what every single thing went wrong and literally tell myself that I'm absolutely the worst and rubbish and rubbish and rubbish. And they hated it and they were never going to book me again. And then 
I'll get an email saying, Tommy, you're absolutely fantastic. Can we rebook for next month? And I'm like, oh, okay. Well, then obviously, I wasn't that bad. They, they, they've rebooked me. So, all right. so, um, so that's what I do all the time. Uh, in fact, that's happened numbers of times. I've walked in and gone, that was terrible. That was rubbish. And then literally they rang me up the next day and rebooked. And I thought, oh, okay, I must have liked something. Um, and then, um, and then uh, yeah, so then I started doing the showcase. And I said to my friend, John Morton, magician, and I said, um, I was in a coffee shop. And I said, right, I need to start doing stage magic. I need to start doing it because I'm getting too old. And if I don't do it now, it's going to be over. And I'm never going to do it. And it's been my dream to be on stage and make people laugh. I said, it's getting too late now. I'm 30 years old. I said, I'm going to miss the boat if, I'm not, if I don't jump on it now. I should have been, I, I felt like I was late to the party. I felt like I should have been doing this at 25 years old. I was like, I'm five years, six years too late. I can't believe I'm doing it. I really need to get this done and moving. And let's get this train moving. And that's why I think I've progressed so fast yeah. is because I've been so like, time is money. I've got to get on with it. Um, so I did the, uh, basically what the showcase is for those you don't know, is basically what I did is I, um, I wanted to put on like an hour and a half or a two hour magic show problem was I don't have well I didn't have an hour and a half or two hours worth of material I probably had maximum 20 minutes and that was max probably more like 15 minutes I had that's all I had well 15 minutes isn't enough for a show is it so then I had an idea for hang on a minute if I get all my magician mates who live close to me if we all do 15 minutes each that's you know a two hour show yeah. or near enough um so I thought brilliant that's what I'll do I got them all together. They all agreed to it. I said, look, all we'll do is 15 minutes. So and they all, and neither of them were stage magicians except for one was, but they were all close with us and they all felt just as nervous as I did. And even though I'd done these award shows, I was still really nervous. So I put the show on and I thought, how am I going to advertise it? I just put it on Facebook. I said, who wants to see a stage show with me and four of the magicians? And literally it sold out just from that. It literally sold out. And that, is because of what I've said about always being the nice guy. If you're always a nice guy, people will follow you and talk to you and when people want to help you. And as soon as I put on, I'm doing a show, every single person I knew was like, yes, Tom, I want to come and see it. And that was what happened. So it worked in my favor in the long run. And then we put it on, we did it. And um, it was a success. And then we sold out one night. We did another one. It sold out that night. Did another one that sold out that night. They've and then we were really like, popular, haven't they? Yeah, they have. And then so what happened was, is the great thing about, the best thing about those showcases was um, that we, um, I basically learned my whole 245 minute act because of it. So I created my 245 minute sets from doing those showcases because I was testing different material out each time. It was, and we only had 50 people. We were, we, had, we, we, we tried a few different venues. I think the maximum we had was about 80 people. But I think that was too many. I think 50 people is really nice and really nice and intimate. It doesn't sound like a good lot, but when you're in front of 50, 60 people, it's still a quite a little big crowd, especially in a small room. Um, and um, yeah, so, that's how that happened. And then I went on to um, do cruise ships with, which is basically, um, again, another lucky story is um, I thought I want to do cruise ships. I don't know why I want to do cruise ships. I just fancy doing cruise ships. And um, I'd been doing these magic showcases and they've been going really, really well. And I thought, wow, I've got, you know, I've got about 45 minutes solid here. And then I've got some other material that, that's floating about that's not in the main 45 minutes but it's just there that i've tried out and then i bumped into um jamie allen at blackpool and this is this is just one of those moments where you just bump into the right person at the right time and i've met jamie a couple of times didn't really know jamie that well but i bumped into jamie allen and we we're just talking about a, a, a routine and then I said to him, I mentioned this, oh, Jamie, I know you do loads of cruise ships. I said, that's something I really want to get into, but I have no idea where to start. 
is like is there any advice you can give me of how like you sort of get into it and then he said well you know i put people forward right and i went no 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 and he said give me a call off the black pole i went right okay give him a call off the black pole and then within i'm not joking uh within three months i had a cruise ship booked in because wow. of jamie wow in fact black and was he went i I spoke to him at the black pole. He went, right, get a show reel together, like now. So I did. I went out and got it all filmed. And he went, right, that's brilliant. And he went, now you need to go to Vegas. So I went to Vegas, performed on a Vegas stage, which was mental. It was in front of a lot of people. And it was like, uh, that was like an audition for the cruise ships. And then from that, I got the, my first cruise ship, which was for Fred Olsen. And then again, last year, I had four all planned in. Uh, but of course they all got pulled because of the pandemic. So um, I really feel like I was really going high on the stage and I was getting really, really good at it. I felt like I was um, being able to spread my wings. They were totally not spread, not yet. I even even spread my wings now, but I, 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 am, I felt like I was starting to loosen up. I went, actually, do you know what? I'm getting quite good at this. I thought... I give myself another three years. I thought, yeah, I'll be good in three or three to five. I thought this is going to be good. So at the minute it's on hold, but uh, I can't wait to get back on stage. So that's me in a nutshell with the stage, man. Well, you know what? I mean, this has been an incredible interview, Tom. It really has. And I've wanted to get you on the channel for a long time. Before we wrap this whole interview up, it's been so amazing. It's been so inspirational. It really has. Because I think a lot of people can relate to your journey and who you are. And you are one of the nicest people I know. Before I wrap it all up, let me ask you one last question. What's okay. next? What's next? Because you've had, and I say this to a lot of people on this channel when I do the interviews, but it's, it's, it's always the same. You have had an amazing career. You know, when somebody gets into magic, they, wanna ha they want to be performing as a close-up magician at high end. Tick, you've done that. They want to create their own magic. You've created your own magic. You've worked with some of the biggest publishers in the in the in the world. You've, you you know you've worked with Miranda, which most people could only dream of. You know you said you wanted to perform on stage. Tick, you've done that. You've got those options open. I know that you have. The second the pandemic ends, you have done everything that you've set out to achieve and then some. Is there anything left on your magical bucket list? Because if you just retired now and decided to go, no, this magic thing, I'm just going to go back and lay bricks again now. You, you know, no, you let, you, a lot of people remember you for a very long time. You have a legacy set in place. But I know that's not the case. So what's next? What's next for Tom Wright? You teased um, the Miranda thing earlier on. And uh, <laughs> but is there anything left on your bucket list? I, do you know what? I feel like I haven't even got started, to be honest. Um, okay, 100% stage, I haven't even, 100% the stage, I feel like I'm totally on the bottom rung on the stage ladder, 100%, 100%. I feel like I, I, <clears throat> I felt like I just literally got off the ground and I was on the first rung, the first rung of the ladder, which took me a long time to get on and I'm like gripping on to that ladder, I'm like I'm not stepping back down. I thought the only way is up now. I'm on this ladder and I'm going up. And I feel like as soon as the pandemic's, pandemic's over, that will continue. Um, and we have got there's a there's a stage show that I might be doing in a variety show, which is going to be great. That could be in the summer uh, and stuff like that. I will continue to do the showcases and I will continue to do the cruise ships. I may I I wanted to get on bigger and better cruise ships, but I've got to take my time because creating the perfect act is going to take a long time um, i'm always um my what i'm gonna what next is i'm gonna try to perfect my stage act it's no way perfected and also I, then again i don't think it'll ever be perfected because you're always trying to perfect your stage act even when you go do you know that's it that's brilliant perfect i'm gonna leave it and then you think of something else and you're oh, I'm gonna go back in and rework it. Um, so, but no, it's still not where I want it to be. It's nearly there. The first set is anyway, the first 45 minutes is nearly, I'm happy, but I know that it'll always change. Uh, but I'm still working on stage stuff now that I want to put in. So yeah, that's next. 
is just keep doing more cruise ships. Close up magic wise, I yeah, I want to just keep doing that and keep getting bigger and better gigs. And I think it's just the idea is just to do bigger gigs and better gigs and more prestigious work. Um, I'd love to work in America. I'd love to more like you know I would love to like um, you know just do a close up gig in New York and then fly back. Now thinking that would be pretty cool. Um, I don't know more. Uh, I would love to possibly maybe in the future do a gig or uh, a show in Vegas. I don't know. Is that too ambitious? No, I'm not sure. Um, I don't know. I'm just going to keep doing the stage stuff and then just see where it takes me and just ride that wave, I think, and just keep doing it in bigger and better. And that's it, I'd love to do. Actually, <clears throat> I need to do, eventually, I would love to do, I would love to tour my own stage show, 100%, definitely. Whether that be me on my own or me with a couple of different acts, or me as um, like uh, me in a warm up or something like that. I don't know, but I would love to tour a theatre show. I think that is what I would love to do, one hundred percent. That would be that would be definitely. I think that's definitely on the cards. That would be next. I don't know when that. That's a that's a while off yet, but yeah, that is something I would aim for. And what about you as a creator? Let's be honest, you're um, talking about top gravity. It's one of the most talked about biggest tricks of the year so far. I don't think I'll top gravity. Oh well, I maybe in the future. Um, I don't know. I mean, I can't you can't top gravity because gra- even if you come up with something else just as good, it's got it's it's not I'm not I don't think I'm ever gonna create anything um with IT again. I think I've hit the crescendo of the IT. Uh, if I do do something with IT, it'll probably be with Joao Miranda again. Um, but um, I think um, I've got to the top of the mountain with the IT work. Um, but uh, there are other stuff that I would love to do with Joao and what's not IT and other things that might happen, maybe. I don't know, see, see what happens. So, uh, but, yeah, yeah. Amazing. You know what? <laughs> Whatever you end up doing, I know that you're going to be successful at it because you're too stupid to give up. You know, you just keep going, you keep going, you keep going, you keep going. And, and I think there's so much that we can learn from that, that you just... You like just a Dura- Duracell battery. Yeah, you just <clears throat> never give up, do you? You just never give up. And, and you know, you're, you're, you're where you are now because of your hard work, your dedication, your perseverance and, and your ambition. And, and I think that those yeah. are qualities that anybody who wants to become a professional magician to try to emulate from you, 100%. 100%. Thanks, man. Thank you very much. Now, this has been an amazing interview. Okay. Two things. One, um, if you haven't seen Tom's, uh, we I did a shorter review with Tom, specifically talking about gravity. I will link to that in the description down below. Go check that out because it is amazing. Uh, secondly... Tom, if people want to connect with you on socials, what's the best place to connect with you? Um, Tom Wright Magician on um, Instagram or uh, Tom Wright Magician on Facebook uh, is uh, is great. Those two really I use uh, a lot. So there you go. Down at the bottom of the screen, you can see that right now. Go and give uh, Tom a subscription. And if people want to buy Gravity, I know we talked about it in the other thing. How can people get in touch with you so they can buy Gravity directly from you? Yeah, if you want to get directly from me, uh, you can you can send me a Facebook message um, or, or Instagram, or you can even send me an email at uh, and my email is tom at tomrightmagic.com. Boom, tom at tomrightmagic.com. It's down there. Go support the creator and, uh, and, and drop an email. Tom, it's been absolutely amazing. Thank you so much. I know you're a busy guy. Uh, I'm honored to call you a friend. You're fantastic. Uh, and like I said, whatever you do, I know it's going to be absolutely amazing. But thanks for t- finding time to be on the channel. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Cheers, mate. Awesome. Loved it. And guys, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Don't forget <coughs> we have 23 videos up every single week. So I'm going to be back tomorrow at 2 o'clock, 6 o'clock, and 9 o'clock. Uh, so if you want to see more videos like this, subscribe to the channel, like the video, leave a comment down below because I'm sure Tom will see it. And I will be back tomorrow with another video. I'll see you then. Thanks very much. Take care.